Hi everyone, it's Unique History Channel, and today we'll be doing a reading from Franco, Soldier, Commander, and Dictator by Jeffrey Jensen, and we'll be reading Chapter 1, From Army Brat to Navy Cadet. Nothing in Franco's family background or the first years of his life gave any indication he would be one day determine the fate of so many lives. Born on December 4th, 1892, to a family with a tradition of staff service in the Spanish Navy, Franco grew up in the glacier region of northwest Spain, in the small Atlantic port town of El Fado. Glacia bears little resemblance to the stereotypical hot dry lands of Don Quixote's central Spain, nor does it resemble the romantic vision of the Mediterranean coast, flamenco, music, gypsies, and bullfights that supposedly characterize life there. In some ways similar to the Pacific Northwest of the United States, or Newfoundland and Canada, Galatia is very green, rainy, and often damp and cold region. The stereotypical Galatian man has little of the bravado and exaggerated personal pride often associated with Spaniards. Instead, he is a melancholic, soft-spoken, suspicious, and prudent. In fact, to this day, Spaniards often argue that Franco's Galatian characteristics profoundly shaped his actions as a soldier and statesman. El Faro was the principal Atlantic base for the Spanish Navy and Franco's father and grandfather both eventually became intendants in its administrative ring, at ranks roughly equivalent to the brigadier general in the army. But the relative professional success of Franco's father, Nicolas, did not bring with it especially happy family life. Franco and his three siblings, a fourth that died in early childhood, grew up as the products of an ultimately failed marriage. Their father had the reputation of someone who enjoyed late nights of drinking and womanizing, and at home he was strict and bad-tempered man who could turn violent at times. In 1907, the same year Franco entered the Infantry Academy, his father abandoned the family for good, moving in with a servant girl whom he spent the rest of his life with. Nevertheless, Franco's childhood was not entirely unpleasant, and the Franco children learned to weather the domestic storms in which they grew up fairly well. Their mother, Pilar, Pilar Bamone, Bamonde, was a very loving and supporting of her children, and she seems to have imbued Franco and his sister Pilar in particular with their belief in turning hard work and dedication to get through difficult times. This attitude helped Franco to endure his trying times as a cadet after he left home. Franco's mother was also a very religious woman, and he himself displayed the same strongly Catholic conservative values later in life. The beliefs of his father, however, were very different. The elder Franco had no interest in religion, rejected many conventional moral values, and held relatively leftist political views in general. He stood, in other words, for all that Franco disliked, and sought to combat later in life. Franco's brother, in contrast, came to resemble their father to a greater degree, although none seems to have strong feelings of affection for him either. In fact, when their mother died in 1934, all the Franco children tried to ignore their father as best they could when making the funeral arrangements. By this point, his sons, all ambitious, had found success in their own ways. According to their sister, Pilar, the oldest brother, Nicholas, suffered the most as a child from his father's fits of anger, but was nevertheless his favorite. When he grew older, Nicholas managed to pursue a noteworthy naval career at the time, and the profession was especially competitive. After he resigned from the Navy, at age 35, he took over the director of the commercial naval shipyard in Valencia on Spain's Mediterranean coast. He had the reputation of a fun-loving man who liked the nightlife. The younger brother, Ramon, found much fame as the Spanish version of Charles Lindbergh. In 1926, he made the first transatlantic crossing to Buenos Aires as a senior pilot of the Plus Ultra, and thereby earning a place in aviation history. In a newspaper interview shortly after the record-setting flight. <clears throat> his father identified Ramon as the most intelligent of his children. Like many pilots at the time of flying was highly dangerous and often a deadly pursuit, he sought to push things to the limit, not just in the air, but in the political world as well. By the late 1920s, he had embraced radical left-wing policies and he actively conspired to overthrow the Spanish monarchy and has established a Republican government. Three months after civil war broke out, however, Ramon turned away from his radical past to side with his brother Franco, 
Francisco Franco, and other conservative generals who wanted to overthrow Spain's first democracy. He died during the war in a flying accident. As a child, though, Franco and his brothers had grown up in a home environment that was far from ideal. <clears throat> Even if the young Francisco could always turn to his mother for love and emotional support. To make things worse, the more the general background to Franco's childhood was unfortunate well. The Spanish Empire of the 1890s was in serious decline, as the Francos and other Spanish families with strong naval ties were painfully aware. On the international scene, the once global Spanish Empire, extending over multiple continents at its height, had been reduced to Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. And this empire disappeared altogether in 1898 when the United States defeated Spain in a war that marked the beginning of America's own rise to an imperial power. As a boy in the naval town of El Fidel, Franco was well aware of the consequences of the Spanish Empire's decline, and he undoubtedly heard at least some of the arguments that raged in his country over whom and what was to blame for the disaster. Although it was doubtful that he had much of a political conscience at the time, he probably heard the argument of a conspiracy of Freemasons that helped facilitate the Spanish laws of empire. In any case, later in life, he did not hesitate to blame Freemasonry for Spain's colonial setbacks and for many other supposed evils of the modern age. On a personal level, the ramifications of 1898 were more immediate. His boyhood companion, Camilo Alfonso Vega, one of his lifelong friends, lost his father in a naval battle near Cuba. Moreover, the Spanish defeat of 1898 contributed to the decision by the bankrupt central government to suspend admissions to the Naval Academy in 1907, which meant Franco could not follow professionally in his father's footsteps. In fact, in Franco's mind, the 1898 disaster was closely related to his personal fate, and the supposed role Freemasons had played in the military defeat only fueled his lifelong fear of Masonic conspiracies. With the Navy no longer a possibility, and even for a Navy preparatory school student like himself, Franco decided to turn to the Army. He now had to decide whether he began his studies at the Army's Infantry, Cavalry, Artillery, or Engineering Academies. The latter, two required five years of study, and the Academy had the most difficult admission standards, although they were rewarded graduates with engineering degrees valid in the civilian world along with their commissions as lieutenants. The infantry and cavalry academics, on the other hand, only demanded three years of study to be followed by two years of practical experience as second lieutenants in an assigned regiment. They were also the easiest to gain admission, making them more attainable for someone like Franco, who had no special academic abilities. Franco chose the infantry academy in Toledo, which was more open to cavalry to the cavalry to applicants without family connections. In August 1907, the small, quiet 14-year-old Franco thus entered the Infantry Academy at Toledo. There he was immediately confronted by the physical remainders of past imperial greatness that far exceeded anything that he had seen in El Fedel. These reminders helped instill him and the other cadets with strong nationalist values, although they have, may have been invited into fortunate comparisons between a glorious history and Spain's far from ideal state of affairs in the early 20th century. The Infantry Academy was held in the Alcazar, an enormous, majestic Moorish fortress perched specifically on the cliff at the edge of the medieval city of Toledo. Its architectural splendor served as a constant reminder to the cadets of their great predecessors, although they now had to make do with an inadequate and outdated weapons, equipment, and educational methods. Franco seems to have been receptive to the extortions by one of his professors who urged cadets to think of the day what happened to the patio arches of barracks represent and the bronze inscriptions adorn the walls about the past glory once present in the very rooms which now you walk. The professor implored his young listeners to catch the spirit and let take in through history, revering and admiring those in his very Alcazar earned world red respect. Franco later claimed that this impression of the Academy not only fused him with a strong sense of nationalist historical values, but also caused him to embrace the army wholeheartedly, distinguishing his once strong desires for naval life embodied by his hometown and family. He was especially moved by the Alcazar's entrance and magnificence of his courtyard of arms, preceded over by the statue of Charles V. Tellingly, the inscription at the base of the statue quoted the late emperor's words about 
a coming campaign in North Africa, the same part of the world where Franco first found his fame. I will either die in Africa or enter victoriously in Tunis. The overall effort, Franco said, was an indescribable flow of emotion. Much has been written about Franco's ears in the academy, with his particularly small size and gradually meek and high-pitched voice did not make any life particularly easy. The initial experience, moreover, were especially difficult for the 14-year-old entering cadet who suffered under initiates' rights mediated by the upperclassmen. Life could be difficult for all the new cadets, but it was especially traumatic for the boy everyone called Franquito, or Little Franco. As an old man, Franco still remembered the painfully the initiation rights he had suffered. He also had to choose a close friends at the academy. The academy life did prepare him to face the subsequent rigors of military life and loneliness of command with a noteworthy stoicism reinforcing his military values and a way of lo- looking at life. Years later, when Franco headed the newly established multi-service General Military Academy, he did his best to draw upon the lessons he had taken from his time as a cadet. <clears throat> and as a commander of the rebel sports forces in the Spanish Civil War and then dictator of his country, he often displayed the same aloof, harsh, and cold personality that seems to have formed in no small part during his difficult days as a cadet. Military speaking, Militarily speaking, the education and training Franco received in Toledo was common. All arms and branches of the services stressed their own importance, and the Spanish infantry was certainly no exception. In the early 20th century, Spain the initially had no influence of the infantry within the army as a whole, especially great, even with new technology, increasingly favored artillery, engineering, and logistics. To the same degree, Spanish military leaders had little choice in the matter. The country simply could not afford many modern weapons or the fruits of new technology. Under such conditions, it made sense to emphasize the role of the infantry in battle. On practical level, the tactical principles Franco learned at the academy were very traditional and did not prove particularly useful when he saw combat in Morocco. As to be expected, the standard Spanish manual and the tactics remained at the low level of the fiercest and stressed small unit tactics, ignoring the operational and strategic questions that advancing officers presumably learned later at the staff college. But even at the tactical level, the manual had surprisingly little to say about the kind of warfare the cadets would soon face in North Africa. Spain is, of course, the country that gave birth to the military term guerrilla or guerrilla for the irregular warriors who had used conventional methods of terror, hidden attacks, sharpshooting, independent actions in their struggle against Napoleon's armies. But according to the manual's definition, the term simply meant a line of men separate between themselves by more or less large intervals who act as skirmishers as the head of echelons. In other words, the manual described guerrillas as a component of traditional regular warfare military units. They were the men in the first line of the advancing unit who would advance in the line but then fall into a guerrilla formation as they approached the enemy. But Franco and his fellow cadets soon faced an enemy in North Africa who used guerrilla tactics as a method of uncertainty and irregular warfare. It is difficult to see, then, how the manual's tactical recommendation or its general emphasis on irregular warfare could have proved very helpful. Most useful to the cadets would have been the manual's explanation that the Moroccan army, Moroccan enemies did not follow the traditional rules of European warfare and that acting, even acting in small numbers, they could have deadly consequences for the Spanish occupiers. Although such discussions did take place in some Spanish military and books and journals, Franco had little or no exposure to them in his formidable readings as a cadet. In fact, years later, Franco himself wrote of the relevance of the older tactics to the Moroccan campaigns. He especially criticized the outdated ideas of guerrilla formations that he had learned as a cadet, writing that in the old style formations it did little more than create highly desired targets for enemy fire. Nevertheless, Franco's military education in Toledo was not entirely outmoded and inadequate, nor was all Spanish military doctrine hopelessly behind at times. Admittedly, infantry cadets learned little in their formal text about the irregular warfare they confronted in Morocco. It is also true that the official tactical manual recommended leading small unit attacks against fortified positions using frontal assaults and strict cremations, as one biographer of Franco writes. By the early 20th century, such unimaginative methods was often used extremely deadly 
and ultimately successful against any reasonable amount of firepower. The manual had little to say about the use of machine guns and other automatic weapons, as critics have, knows, have noted, but the omission was part of the story. In fact, the manual was soon supplanted by a 150-page text devoted solely to the infantry's use of machine guns, and texts on many other aspects of infantry fighting were also published. Some of these manuals discuss surprisingly advanced tactical concepts. For example, several years after Franco received his first commission, but before the British experience at Gapoli, an official manual combined infantry and naval tactics in an ambitious landing saw print. This manual pre- represented an early step towards successful Spanish landing at El Hosima Bay in 1925, which Franco took part. The El Hosima operation involving ground, air, and naval forces from two European countries and indigenous North African units. Foreshadowed the kind of combined arms coordination that Franco's side came closest to mastering in the Spanish Civil War. Franco then may have not received the best training educational possible during his stay at the Infantry Academy in Toledo. Many of his professors were not particularly competent, and in any case, he was certainly not an outstanding student throughout his life. His writings betrayed the lack of good academic foundation, but it does not mean that his generation of Toledo-educated military elite were always lacking as a whole. Its members overcame initial grave setbacks in North Africa, and eventually developed into the tactical and operational methods that finally achieved the o- to the control of the occupied territories a bit at their very high cost to Moroccans and Spaniards alike. The director of studies and later overall director of academy was Colonel José Riba Ricamende, a man who spent much of his career in North Africa and whose path soon crossed Franco's again. Another frequent criticism of Franco's military education concerns an outdated emphasis on the traditional infantry tactics rather than use of artillery and other technological advances in weapons and equipment. Indeed, many many of his professors did clearly stress the moral forces in warfare, including a fighting spirit, national fervor, morale, instead of a new technology. The implication to cadets sometimes made explicitly was that such moral attributes could make it possible to overcome an enemy with superior weapons, but an insufficient fighting spirit. For this reason, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 generated intense discussions in the military circles. In this war, the Japanese had seemingly used their spirit of national self-sacrifice and warrior values to overcome the defensive firepower of the Russian opponents. The war had made an especially strong impression on military thinkers all over Europe, in part for racist reason, most had not expected the non-white Japanese armed forces to defeat a European army like that of the Russians. Franco's dis- dictatorship later promoted the supposed lessons of the war in Japanese ethos Bushido. During his days as a cadet, Franco probably did not pay much attention to the supposed morals of the Russo-Japanese war, but the conflict in- influenced him what he was taught. Therefore, the lessons of the war reached him and other key officers explicitly while they were serving in Morocco. Jose Milan Astre, the founder of the Spanish Foreign Legion under whom Franco served in the 1920s, deemed a subject highly relevant to Spain. More than a decade earlier, he had made lessons in Bushido as a part of the curriculum in his class of military morals at the Infantry Academy. The appeal of emphasizing spiritual, moral forces, and Warrior values like those of Bushido over modern weapons, technology was especially strong in a country like Spain, which could not afford to modernize its war fighting capabilities even if it so desired. It is yet important to remember that Franco and other Spanish officers to be were not only the European cadets to receive a military education em- emphasizing infantry morale and the supposed superiority of an inspired front- frontal attack over defensive firepower and technology. In fact, armies throughout the Western world had not only drawn the same lessons as the Spaniards from the Russo-Japanese War, but they interpreted them as further support for doctrines gained direct attacks against fortified position. The so-called cult of the offensive characterized much military doctrine until the least first part of World War I, even in those countries with far more money than Spain spent on new artillery and other more advanced technolo- 
which are alternatives to the old-fashioned morale-driven infantry attack. In a sense, moreover, the Spanish advocates of the cult of the offensive had more justifications for their emphasis on morale than did their counterparts from a richer, better-equipped armies of Germany and France, especially before the bloodbaths of World War I made dangers of frontal attack painfully apparent. With such poor material resources, the Spaniards had no other option. The Infantry Academy in Toledo may have failed to incorporate the lessons of modern warfare and technology into its curriculum, but this failure did not necessarily indicate that the Spanish military doctrine was hopefully behind the times. Furthermore, the Spanish infantry military was not the only such institution in Europe to teach ostensibly outdated skills, and many academies continue to do so on this day. In many cases, the goal is not so much technical or practical, as in part of the imparting of collective military values. Such an aim could serve as a justification to the continued presence of everything of the many stables at Britain's Royal Academy Royal Academy Sandhurst to the courses on sailing traditional seamanship at the U.S. Naval Academy. And the same largely explains the countless hours of drilling on paved surfaces that the cadets everywhere still must endure, even in an age of mass motorized transport and rapid loading and firing weapons. Admittedly, politics and special interests had an especially strong tendency in Spain to hinder the translation of ideas into practice. Indeed, the Spanish military suffered from an acute professional bureaucratic culture of resistance to change. Hence, the obstacles that would-be reformers faced were often the making of the military officers themselves and their own political, corporate interests. Nevertheless, the graduates of the Infantry Academy from Franco's generation entered the Spanish military at a time when, the least theoretical level, its elite were particularly diverse and receptive to new ideas and debates. The graduates may have not absorbed much, if any, of this intellectual dynamicism as cadets, but more intelligent and interested ones could do later. So, Spain's many journals of military thought, public presentations, and staff colleges. Franco himself, who graduated only 251st in an academy of 312 cadets, never excelled in this world, but he barely participated in the thriving elite Spanish military culture of books, periodicals, and intellectual societies. He did, however, eventually reap the benefits of some of the better operational thinkers to come out of this culture, bringing together their talents and practical leadership skills he acquired in Morocco. The final ingredients in this effective mixture were luck and set of military and conservative national values at this Toledo education that so deeply ingrained in his psyche. In the end, he learned to harness and steer these elements, took advantage of the right domestic and internal conditions, and emerged as a triumphant commander-in-chief and long-running dictator. Okay, thank you.